Hey, and welcome to the Strategy Sessions. I'm Andy Jarvis, and thank you for listening to the show. We're at episode 21 today, and the main guest is Lizzie Knight-Ward. Lizzie is one of the marketing managers at LinkedIn. And in this, we dive into a whole load of stuff about LinkedIn. Not just how do you use it and how do you make it better for you as an individual. There's some T-O-P-T-I-P's about that, um, about 40 minutes into the interview but also about what Lizzie does for her main job, which is B2B marketing. Um, So there's lots of really, really good stuff in there in terms of how you can stop B2B from being boring to boring and how you can actually make it work for your organization. Um, But if you're not a B2B marketer, you might think, okay, I'll switch off now. I'd say don't do that just yet. This is a really great story. Lizzie's worked at YouTube and she got on YouTube because she was a big hit on Google Plus. Google Plus, God rest its soul. Um, some of you, are young, my younger listeners might be going, what the hell is Google Plus? It was a really great search engine that Google, uh, have social media channel, sorry, that Google managed to screw up. Um, there was loads of good things about um, Google Plus. Unfortunately, number of users was not one of them and uh, it died and was quietly sort of put out to pasture um, a, a long time ago. But Lizzie was big on Google Plus, which got her into YouTube. So she's worked at YouTube, Google obviously is part of that. She's worked at, um, at, at LinkedIn and has a great career, a great CV, lots of good advice about getting those jobs, lots of advice about um, doing well in those jobs, about marketing. Really, really interesting episode with lots of stuff to talk about. But before we get into Lizzie's episode, I have something exciting to tell you. Well, I think it's exciting. Um, This week, I just launched a new online digital marketing strategy module with the University of Vasa in Finland. This is um, a collaboration between myself at Exmo Marketing and the university, which is just the real perfect way of delivering this course. So it's an online only course, fully remote digital marketing strategy. It's about 250 euros and you dive in, watch all the videos online. Now, it's not in Finnish, as you'd expect. I'm doing, I'm um, teaching the course. Don't speak a word of Finnish. It's all in English. The university is looking to expand and spread into more international students. And my course is part of that plan. So I'm really excited about this. So why why should you sign up? Who's it for? Um, It's for business owners, business leaders, entrepreneurs, people like that who are trying to set a a marketing strategy for their organization, not really sure how to do it. But also if you're a marketer looking to to kind of step up and be a bit more strategic, this would be a brilliant course for you too. If you get a pen and paper ready and work your way through the course as you're doing it, by the end of it, you'll actually have the bulk of a digital marketing strategy ready to be able to implement the next day. So it covers the basics. If you've heard me talk before, it covers all the basics and the stuff that I usually talk about. Doing the data stage, how do you collect all the information to be able to create the strategy? look at your company, why do you do things, what's important to your audience, look at customer, who are you trying to target, look um, externally at context of your industry and competition, what other things, what things are the people are doing, and then look internally again at what competency and skills do you have access to, and also what content and stories you can tell about your organization that will really bring it to life. We look at capital, how much money do you need to spend? Um, What are your objectives for the year? How do you tie that into your business objectives? How do you tie that into your marketing objectives? And we also look at what do you do next? How do you create a three-page marketing plan that will help you deliver it? And then what's your, your operating model? How do you bring this to life with a weekly, monthly, quarterly rhythm of meetings and structured way of delivering it so that you actually deliver on what it is that you've said you're gonna do? I've seen so much marketing that starts with a brilliant strategy on loads of bits of paper and you go, wow, this is an amazing document. Never gets touched again. I've seen some brilliant marketing plans. I've seen some bloody awful ones too. Some utter shit that are like 80 pages long. Nobody's using that, mate. Nobody. But I've seen some good marketing plans that flounder because, well, they look great. They're doing great things, but they're not connected to the strategy. So nobody else in the organization cares or no one ever delivers them properly because there's no plan and there's no way of doing it. So this digital marketing strategy module, I'll also explain in that, is it digital marketing? Is it marketing? Is there a difference? Should you care? But in this, you get the strategy bit, you get the planning bit, and also how to deliver it as well. There's a step in each of them. 250 euros, absolute steal. Get it on the company credit card, sign up today. It takes about... 20 hours to go through everything if you do all the reading and everything that's connected with it. I would say there's about four uh, the videos in there, a bit shorter, but there's some 
um, external reading, some blogs to read, some videos to watch, um, some academic reading to do. Not much academic reading, but enough to set it all in context. It is academically developed. It's rigorous from that side of things. It's taught with the university, of course. But not only that, it's practically really, really useful. I, I've used this model with over 100 clients in the last number of years. And I could say it's worked in pretty much every sector I've taken it into. Charities, it's worked with governing bodies, it's worked with government bodies, it's worked with B2B, B2C, small, medium, large. It's worked across everything. Structure is universal. The questions you ask, of course, they're going to be different. Context for each industry is different. That's why we look at context. But the questions you ask um, no, I, I differ but the structure can work across everything. So have a look. There's a link in the show notes. If you go to that link, there's a little welcome video in there. You can watch the video go, is this something I fancy? If it is, put your credit card details in, buy it, do it. Let us know what you think afterwards. It'd be wonderful to have you as part of the course. You can tell I'm really excited about it. I'm hyper, I'm a bundle of energy about it. I think it's fantastic. I'm really, really um, pleased to have it live and I hope you like it too. Do let me know what your feedback is on it. If you do the course, I'd be really interested to hear from you. Um, you'll be getting a survey afterwards as well, but you know, where would you like it improving? Where do you need more? That's always really important. Enough of me selling my stuff now. You came to listen to Lizzie Knight's Ward from LinkedIn. So let's get straight over to Lizzie now. Here we go, Lizzie. Have you here? So tell us, what do you do at LinkedIn? LinkedIn's a huge company. There's loads of different roles there. What's your focus? So I lead the content and social marketing team for two of our business units. So LinkedIn Marketing Solutions and LinkedIn Sales Solutions. My remit and my team's remit is Europe and Latin America. Um, it's actually very nearly my two year two year birthday at LinkedIn. So approaching that, that milestone soon. Um, and really my team are responsible for creating top of funnel, middle of funnel content, thought leadership, um, awareness content, all the, all the fun things of content marketing. And that's what we do. Brilliant. And that's quite a, a big geographical patch. Um, mm. Europe and Latin America, very, I can't even think how many countries would, would probably fall under that, but lots of different uh, languages, lots of different um, outlooks on life, different, you know, that, lots of different com people and, and targets in there. So how do yeah. you help to, how do you focus on delivering specific content across all those different markets? Well, a lot of it comes from working incredibly closely with our partners across those regions. So whether that's sales partners, um, our marketer, our fellow marketers, you know, we all have um, marketers within each region. So really, we lean on them and, and partner with them to help inform our content strategy and to really give us the best chance to create something that can be scalable, that can be localized easily. We do a lot of big thought leadership pieces built from research. So when we're doing the research, we're sure to incorporate our other regions to try and make sure we're getting a full picture or able to differentiate between the regions. A common assumption and something I've learned in my career, always working uh, in EMEA or across Europe is that it's easy to assume that we all speak the same language. Um, and I mean that in multiple ways. And I think if you, you've got to spend the time really trying to understand local nuance, and localization goes beyond translation. You know, it, it's more about you know, what are the different behaviors, what are the different buying cycles, the maturity of different markets. You know, it's it's not a one size fits all approach, and that can be challenging when it comes to content marketing because the the easier option would just be to create one piece and say, here you go. But you know, when you take the feedback and the 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 sort of the nuance of each market you can't you you learn very quickly it isn't a case of of one size fits all yeah no we, i had um, a, a professor uh kuhn paus from uh northeastern university in america on, on the show not long ago and he was saying some of the research he's done showed the difference in certainly for fmcg products in brazil for example where the consideration mm -hmm. phase is huge where when they when they started to do the um, the qual research and talk to customers they'd hear about something, but then would spend a really long time talking to people in their network and friends, kind of getting reassurance that they should try or buy this thing, which is just something that you said in European markets doesn't necessarily happen. So people see a TV ad and it goes, oh, this is the thing you need. Let, let's do that bang and they go and buy it. And, yeah. and sort of those different thoughts on buying behavior were really interesting to hear from, from his point of view. Um, yeah, I think sometimes you can, you can spend, um, 
you've got to be prepared to spend the time learning about those markets. I think for me, I'm one of my biggest regrets in my career is, or actually not my career, but my education is not paying enough attention to my French and German lessons. I wasn't bad, but I often think if I'd, if I'd carried those on, I would have been able to actually speak the language. And I've always been incredibly lucky in my career and the teams that I've led, nearly all of them have had um, multilingual abilities I've worked with people who have like five or six languages and I'm just blown away by how this is a thing for people. Whereas, you know, I think learning language is a bit like musical talent. You, you have it, you can learn it, but you either have the gift to sort of really get it or you don't. So I've often lent on other people's experience to help educate me mm -hmm. within those uh, markets and, and the differences. But, you know, as someone who is only an English speaker, I've had to learn to put the time in versus just assuming that, hey, what I create here is going to be brilliant for you. It, it, it just doesn't work that way. Yeah, no, but really, really important. And I think it, sometimes in, in Britain, the way we teach languages doesn't necessarily help us is that we're almost taught languages as a, a holiday language as opposed to mm. actually speaking the language, which yeah, is a bit yeah. of a difference from say in Holland, where they, they taught the language as just a, a, as easily as they taught their own language, which is quite yeah. a different approach. Um, but we'll, we'll rip the education system to bits later. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, but, and so in terms of the content you're creating, um, if I had a criticism of not your work, but generally when I hear marketers talk about doing top of the funnel content, what they often mean when they say that is they, they're gonna try and do something and set some really woolly objectives with it so they can claim success even though they've not really done anything. When you talk about bottom of the funnel content, people are saying, well, it, you know, we spent this, we got that. Top of the yeah. funnel, oh, we, we raised awareness. Um, I, I am absolutely certain you don't look at it that way. So talk us through how, how it works at LinkedIn. So, I mean, it works in multiple ways. It, it really is objective based. So, you know, we're a very large matrix organization. So we're not all working towards the same segment or audience persona at any given time. Um, so really for us, it's about it in EMEA with my team, what we try to do is really understand the direct, actually this has come about really through COVID. We had to pivot very, very quickly last year to, as everybody did, to make sure that we were basically there for our clients in what was an extreme time of need. So it really became about embedding ourselves with our field marketers who are closest to the sales teams with our sales teams to understand exactly what the the common challenges were and then we would create the plan back from there so a lot of it is around telling the story and creating the perspective of why as a marketer you need to either be agile or be ready or, or whatever the topic might be and then really you know set the scene tell the story start the conversation but then be able to back it up with, well, here's how you actually do it. And I'd say that's one of the biggest, or the, the, the common things that followed me around my content and social marketing career is every, not so much these days, because I'm, I'm better at doing it, but you know, back in the day when I present a bit of content or a plan or an idea, so often the, the feedback from my senior stakeholders was, this is good, but what's the so what? And I used to think, oh, what do you mean? What, what's the so what? Like, it's the worst bit of feedback you can get. But it was actually a point, you know, what is the so what? What do you want your marketer or your seller, whoever it is you're marketing to? What do you want them to do? What do you want them to change? And if you can start answering those questions and bring in the holy grail of and here's how our product can help you even if that's not explicitly called out, you know, it's, it's the, it's the journey. You, you're going to get there eventually. You know, that, that for me is, the, I would say the fundamental rule of our, of our team's ethos. You know, we, we're really just trying to facilitate a conversation, but have the proof to back it up. Um, and a, another sort of facet of that, actually, I, I'm sure you, I, I used to get this when I worked at Hootsuite, I used to get this when I worked at Google those years ago was this is really interesting, but how do you guys do it at, at Hootsuite? How do you do it at LinkedIn? How do you do it at Google? So there's always this other layer that we're able, I guess we have the privilege of being able to bring into our content is the, the LinkedIn story or the, you know, the, the internal case study, because if you've got to practice what you preach, I mean, it's, it's not all, it's not new news, the whole idea of drinking your own champagne or dog fooding and all the, weird sayings you have around those things but it's I always so important my own yeah 
Or... Yeah. <laughs> Actually, do you know what? I, I had a conversation the other day where we some someone and I talked about dog fooding. I was like, I haven't used that phrase now in years. And I'm so glad I haven't because it's one of those like, <laughs> why do we say this? But yeah, so there, there is this real kind of, I guess, privileged position that I'm in working at a company like LinkedIn, like LinkedIn where we, you know, we're, we're a massive matrix organization. We are working with multiple businesses of all shapes and sizes. So that the level of knowledge that's flying around and expertise and skills and you name it, it's just amazing to like bring that into the content as well. Cause I'd say that is something that does set us apart perhaps from, from your average kind of content marketing strategy. Well, look, let, let's, um, I want to come on shortly and talk about your career. You've mentioned Hootsuite and Google, and I think we can dive into that a little bit as well. But before we, we move off content, can you talk to us about maybe a, a piece of content that you've done or a, a campaign that you've done that really stands out and and pull it apart a little bit. Tell us, you know, who was it for? Why did you do it? And why do you think it worked better? Just, you know, let's let's do yeah. the, the retro on it. Let's have a look at that bit. Well, I've got, I mean, I've got a fair list of campaigns that I could bring to the table, but I suppose I'll, I'll go with the one that, so in my role as, as, the, as the team lead, the manager, obviously I, I, I manage a team of expert content creators who are always creating epic campaigns. And I feel like I can't use one of theirs because I'm taking the credit. But I also have this sort of, I guess, slight player coach role. And that's not because I have to, it's because I, I haven't ever really let go of the love for creating content. So as much as I have a, a huge remit of managing this very productive team, I also like to continue with my own campaign. So I would say, let's pick the most recent one. So very, very recently, my colleague, Jennifer Bunting, she leads our um, product marketing for Europe and, and LATAM as well, we released a five part video series that really unpacks um, video advertising on LinkedIn. And it, it's kind of a strange serendipitous thing in that we filmed this really like beautifully shot video series the day before we had to close the offices for, for COVID, you know, we were all sent home. Yeah. And in some kind of weird, I don't know, prediction that the agency that we worked with useful social brilliant brilliant group they um they said we looked better if we sat further apart we we're on these two chairs uh, the reason why we did this is because the research that jennifer had conducted because all of our big content campaigns there's a, a big research element behind them and she spent like months and months watching hundreds of video ads on on linkedin it's just like i don't know how she did it but one say, of the that sounds painful <laughs> Well, yes, but the pain is gained because some of the some of the insights that we've we've drawn from this research is just it's brilliant. And this is one of them. There was a video or an ad by a client that was one of the best performing ads on LinkedIn of of that year of 2019. And it was just two gentlemen sitting on very small, almost toadstool like stools, sort mm -hmm. of at a strange angle, face to face, talking to each other. And it drove all this engagement. And one of the sort of trends that popped up in this research was this: the visual look of a video is, is incredibly important. And the almost the more unusual, the more potential for hooking in your hooking in your viewer. So, of course, our agency, in the name of practicing what we preached, had recommended that we had this sort of interesting position in these two chairs. And when we watched the video back, we realized that we were actually two meters apart, and that it was a fully open space. It was like social distancing yes, before anybody cause, knew it yeah because there was a lot of work that I suppose we had to um we did have to deprioritize because it it didn't suddenly wasn't relevant you know if, you, if you're shooting outside for example in a big busy crowd like that that wasn't going to hit the message for the next however long and of course none of us could predict how long so anyway long story we've just launched this research and these video series and this campaign which really is I mean I, I can't take credit for the, the content or the, the content of the content <laughs> because it was Jennifer's research but what we wanted to do is really try and make it accessible for our audience by turning it into something practical and something relatable and something that you could actually put into put into your strategy there and then so often you know you'll see things that you already know especially when it comes to video marketing mm -hmm. but really boiling down things into this is exactly why you should do this versus why you shouldn't do this for us isn't something that we've we've necessarily 
done before. And I suppose the reason why I put my hand up to work with Jennifer on this is because I would say, as a content marketer, you're looking for the holy, the holy grail of amazing thought leadership topic that can really track all the way down the funnel. And it's surprising, it's not often that you actually get a perfectly matched product to a thought leadership topic. To give you an example, another campaign that I've worked on, and which I'm sure we'll talk about, sales and marketing alignment, did a mm -hmm. huge piece of huge piece of research, really, really interesting piece of research. But actually, it's quite difficult to specifically show this is exactly how your product can help on sales and marketing alignment because it's such a broad topic. And yes, we've got tools and parts of marketing solutions that can work with sales solutions. It's there, but it isn't necessarily as clear cut as something like the video ads product or you know LinkedIn events or whatever it might be we're able to create thought leadership around. And I think that's really what you've got to try and look for is, again, to that question of what do you want your customer to do? You've got to be there to help them do it. Um, so yes, I, I think I've gone all over the place and I haven't really unpacked the video campaign. It's just launched five part series, incredibly interesting tips and tricks um, and just an interesting visual. And I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing how it performs because I have a hunch that it might do better than your average. So <laughs> well, we, we will include a link to that in the, in, in yeah, the show notes yeah. so that, that if you're, you're listening, if you're watching, find the show notes, click on it, go, go and have a look and, um, and, and see that campaign. I think what what you're talking about there as well about the uh, those videos of the, the the two guys talking and the way you've replicated that, um, and I'm sure the content from what I've seen is going to be interesting and uh, moving into being entertaining as well. And we spoke uh, before when we were, we were prepping for this uh, about I try and keep this podcast entertaining if I can, mm -hmm. um, because having listened to many podcasts, they're really not. But also on a wider point, business to business marketing is not interesting mainly, and he's definitely not entertaining in most cases. Um, regular listeners will know that I call B2B marketing boring to boring marketing. Um, no. <laughs> because it, it, it's just dull. And um, where you see it done well, and I, I, I have no scientific analysis for this, but I think when people pull out all the great B2B campaigns that they've seen over time, the one thing they have in common is they're all entertaining. Mm -hmm. And I'm still yeah. amazed that people yeah. haven't switched on to that. So uh, what's your view on, on boring to boring marketing? Do you, you know, do you sort of spend your life railing against this? How, how do you cope with it? Do you know, not so much anymore because personal opinion, I don't think it's, I don't think what my team and I create and what we create at LinkedIn is boring. And I suppose perhaps for years before we have rallied against the idea of it being boring. And we have spent a lot of time looking at what we can learn from B to C Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think that's actually a common misconception or, or a mistake to sort of see them as very separate things. But and I know what, how this sounds because it's not new news. But at the end of the day, we're all human beings. We're all people. Yep. Yes, we're marketers. Yes, we're B2B. But we have lives. We have families. We have we're fun. You know, it's it's it seems or you, you're missing a step if you're treating them very separately in terms of the techniques of marketing. I, I'm, I'm not saying like the customers are the same or anything like that. That's just not reality. But so I think like we the team that I work with are probably some of the best content marketers that I've ever met. They're tons better than me. Like I sometimes think, where are you getting these ideas from? How do you have this? Because I I'm good old, you know, old fashioned in, in some ways, but they're always challenging themselves. They're always trying to find the next thing and be on the edge of, of content marketing trends. Um, to give you an example, I have a, uh, there's a, a woman or a girl, a woman on my team called Grace. She has recently, um, it's not that recent anymore, but she uh, launched something called LinkedIn Advantage. And what she done is taken the model of um, choose your own adventure, Netflix, Bandersnatch, all of those great things, and applied that to essentially our product, um, worked with a great agency to bring it to life. It's this beautiful animated adventure that you as a marketer mm -hmm. click different options to determine how to create or optimize a strategy for lead gen or brand building. And that on paper sounds like, oh, that sounds thrilling. But actually, when you go through it, you suddenly you've done it, you've got all these tips, all this great content because she just dared to think a little bit differently and, and bring in some of that consumer 
sort of um you know how especially in the pandemic with the consumption of video is like yeah. whew, and, well, yeah. already i want to go and look for that campaign so again there'll be a link in the show notes yes i'll, I'll send you um, but i, <laughs> I you know i want to go and look at that but i, I think my, my, my point is, is that I don't know. If we went and had a look at B2B marketing generally, what we're going to see is a whole collection of white papers uh, or ebooks, which are just derivative of an ebook that their competitor wrote a year ago. And all they're trying to do is hijack just to get a little bit higher in search engine rankings mm -hmm. by, you know, instead of having 13 tips to do whatever, having 17 tips. Uh, oh, lads, come on. We've got to be better than this, please. Do you know, I saw an article um, on LinkedIn the other day that said, a, a new article that said the PDF is dead. And I was like, well, hang on. I mean, this isn't new news. And I was, I was reading through it and I was like, it is amazing how many PDF based marketing campaigns still exist. And I, I'm not going to lie, like we, we do PDFs within our within our content campaigns. Mm -hmm. And the reason is every time we don't do a PDF and let's say we do a a shorter version of the report or we distill the research in in its own form blog post video whatever it might be there's always people that say have you got the full report so I, I i think the pdf is dead as the central asset to your content marketing campaign and that's where you do get into this very repetitive boring thing if it's a smaller part of it it's it's going to serve a need that some of our audience still have um, whereas a lot of our audience doesn't, they, they want quick content, snackable insights. How do I make this work for me now? But I think you, if you're discounting it all, uh, you know, it, it doesn't have to be boring. <laughs> I don't know. And, and, and I think the thing about, um, my, my other great annoyance is marketers are wonderful at declaring things dead. It seems to be, <laughs> you, you can't be a marketer unless you've declared something dead. I haven't um, declared anything dead. You, before. You have, I, listen, Lizzie, go back over your career at some point. <laughs> you will have declared something dead. Absolutely okay. certain. Um, I, I'm going to admit something rather embarrassing here. I once declared LinkedIn dead or <gasps> dying. Um, it would have been maybe 2013. So it was pre the, pre the Microsoft acquisition. Um, and it, it, the product felt like I'd, I've been on LinkedIn long before that and it felt like it was changing and evolving and there was maybe a year or two period where it just felt like it had stagnated and it, the algorithm wasn't right and it just sort of it, it turned into I, I don't know it, it just didn't feel like it had moved on at all um which, which I, you know I was wrong about it you know the product seems to devolve and develop evolve not devolve sorry and evolve and ev develop I'll put my teeth in um and and, and gets better um, but yeah, I, I declared it dead. Marketers declare off loads of stuff dead. But I, I think we sometimes forget how untypical marketers are of the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I work with agencies and I, I go into some great places and marketers are sat there with top of the range MacBooks, great tech, doing these one things. Alone. The PDF's dead. I work with a, an enterprise, a, a very, very well-known UK brand, um, enterprise level, tens of thousands of staff, and the thing that strikes me every time I go into their office, which I haven't done for a while, but the, the thing that really strikes me when I go into their office is just how shit all their computers are. <laughs> you know, like I, one of the people I work with has to turn their computer on in the morning and then we yeah. go and have a coffee and have a chat while their computer boots up. Like this is a company that counts its turnover in many, many billions yeah. of pounds yeah. a year and their tech is awful. And then, you know, so market is like going, oh, well, this works brilliantly on this 48 inch Mac screen that I've got here. And going, yeah. yeah, but someone's using a nine year old Android to look at that. You do, you do forget. I, I think, again, that, that sort of comes with the, I suppose, the, the both the privilege and also the, I, I don't want to say blissful ignorance, because I don't think it's blissful necessary. But if you are working in like forward thinking companies or big tech companies, you are most likely going to have the best of the best and that means everything equipment opportunities you know it, it is a part of it but I think that's where historically marketers have perhaps um got into or fallen into the trap of assumption to your point like the, the, the assumption that everyone's going to experience something in the same way and a lot of the work again that my team have, have really started to laser focus in on the more we create these perhaps less boring campaigns so these more interesting content formats is the accessibility of those mm -hmm. um, both in terms of how it actually appears on screens but also from a neuro neurodiversity point you know that there oh. is it is not something that 
if you you're alienating so much if you're just thinking it's a it's one size fits all and then the other part of that is the risk of assumption that your audience are all experts so just to give you an example on this years ago it feels like years ago it wasn't actually that long but when I was at at Hootsuite I did a lot of a lot of speaking a lot of keynotes about social trends and what, what was coming next and one of the big um, campaigns that we did when I was there was all around this idea of human to human marketing and it, it became a big thing for many b2b organizations well actually yeah more so b2b like remember that we're all humans how do you talk to the human and remember when I first got the keynote and started to add my own touches to it and think about presenting it I just felt I felt like a I was about to go onto stage to tell everybody exactly what they knew and I was going to be laughed off and okay maybe a little bit of imposter syndrome had crept in because it usually does for most people but and I remember thinking this is obvious surely am I am I going mad and of course I, I gave the keynote and I, I couldn't believe how many people were taking notes asking questions tweeting that this was like one of the best things that they'd seen not necessarily me presenting it the content I've seen you and, um, present, Lizzie. It would have well, been that as well. You saw me present with a near broken toe after my accident in the mess pill in Dublin. Oh no, not the not the mess pill. It was um oh my god the 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 Shelburne. Yes, yeah. dropped a dropped a luggage rack on my toe just before I had to come and speak. Anyway, um so I, and, and it, it dawned on me in that moment with all these like this is really interesting. I, I haven't thought of this before. Is that because I had been in the organisation that had. You know, one of the organizations that were putting this message out and I've been involved in the creation of it and it all seemed completely obvious to me but of course that was me assuming that everybody knew what we were talking about and I think that's again a really important thing to remember when it comes to both content and social marketing is that you literally live and breathe this as a as your career nobody not everybody else does and therefore you've got to You've got to remember that people aren't necessarily as up to speed as you are. There's a lot of, um, I, I think you need a lot of humility to be a marketer. I think we, we have a bad reputation in, in the wider world as um, probably just below bankers and estate agents as, uh, as complete assholes. Uh, but it, it's not true in my experience of marketers. And I think that the best marketers have that humility to put themselves in their audience's shoes. And, and it, it's an underrated quality, I think. And it's hard to teach as well. You, know, you can't learn that at yeah. university, can you? Yeah, yeah. no, no. Talking about, so let, let's dive into you you and your background a little bit then. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned you, you worked at Hootsuite and, and also at Google. So, you, you know, you, you're uh, you're ticking off all the, the major tech companies that everybody wants to go and work for. Um, how, you know, how talk about how your career developed. I don't know if you want to start at LinkedIn and work backwards from there. Yeah, well, it's a bit of a weird one um, because I'd like to tell you that I just had this big plan that I wanted to go and work for some of these big tech organizations. And it was, you know, all it's all fallen into place exactly how it how it should have but it's not how it worked um so my time at LinkedIn I mean like I said I've been here for for very nearly two years Mm -hmm. and I would say out of all the places I've worked and it isn't just because I work here this is my favorite place and I think it's because I the roles I've had previously haven't necessarily been at this level they haven't necessarily had the access to or I haven't known so much about what I'm good at and what I want Mm -hmm. to do so I, I think it it, it, there's a context of I'm incredibly lucky to be in the role that I'm in working with the people that I work with but I think if I joined LinkedIn te- when I joined Google when I was just a actually joined as a contractor lone lowly coordinator like I, I didn't appreciate perhaps it as much as I appreciate LinkedIn and all the things that I'm being taught so my my career though is weird because when I left university I had very grand ideas of uh, grand ideas. My plan B was to become a writer. My plan A at the time was what I was living and breathing for about 15 years, which was uh, I was a singer songwriter. And that was my biggest thing in life. My, my career, my job was always plan B. It sort of was a second thing. And I didn't really think about jobs. I just wanted to write music and I took very low paid jobs just so I could play music, play gigs in London, write songs, all about, you know, my heartbreak and all the all the fun things that you do as a young, young musician. And my music just became like my I had a I had two lives. So I was 
gigging throughout the UK. I would gig in different countries. I was played on the radio. Um, I have been on TV a lot. My songs have been used on TV, all this stuff. And I weirdly moved to Australia for two years and I moved to a tiny little town in Western Australia uh, for personal reasons. I, I went with a boyfriend at the time. I was going to say that, that this, <laughs> this has got heartbreak written all I know, over it. I, sorry, yeah, it has. So I, I went to um, Western Australia, left London. And in that time, I suppose I had, again, hadn't really thought about how lucky I was to live in London or the UK where the, the gig scene was just you know, you walked down Upper Street and you there were five musicians playing in any different bar in Islington, right? And I was very lucky because I'd worked my way through the the sort of maybe the dirtier pubs to playing at really nice places. Um, you know, before I left for Australia, I played at Camden Roundhouse. Um, I used to play at the Hope and Anchor, which was one of my favourite pubs, uh, Brixton Windmill, all that like, really good oh, yeah, these are great venues. venues yeah. yeah, and then I moved to this tiny town in Western Australia, and suddenly there was one, one gig venue that had a six month waiting list because it was for all the Australian touring bands. And there was little old English me turned up going, can I play? And they're like, uh, who are you? No, what? Anyway, so I needed to find another way to get my music out there because at that point it was still like the only thing that, that I really cared about. And I started to uh, stream my gigs on YouTube and Google Plus remember google plus it was a thing uh, it changed my life it, it changed, google plus. yeah it, it genuinely changed my life so i was one of the weird ones that somehow managed to make google plus work for me and i built up a community yeah. on google plus you can probably see where this is going so I'll whisper, whisper it quietly i loved google plus <laughs> i thought it was amazing i, I really was, really liked it but uh, it, anyway sorry. um yeah no it was um so i i built this community on google plus of around about 50,000 followers who were really engaged with my music, my poetry. I used to write a lot of poetry. My videos are very we're, sketch. We're going to link to it. You must have a, a YouTube profile. I, but yeah, I, we're going to link I, to I, this. Yeah. Um, I, a few sketchy uh, homemade videos that I tried to edit and all this kind of stuff. Anyway, it caught the attention of the Google team in Sydney who invited me to talk to them interview sort of press team thing and tell them about how I was um, using Google Plus and then it ended up in a I went over there for a two-week trip to spend two weeks with the Google team I went to the ARIA awards I, like I did load, like all these gigs with them I was teaching or helping other record labels understand how to use Google Plus for their for their music uh, their, their acts and anyway, because I've made contacts at Google, eventually I was um, approached about a community management role on a small medium business team. And it was like a job that was going to allow me to do all my music and sort of be the face of Google Plus, if you will, in Sydney and in Australia and have a job that for the first time was actually something that I was really interested in and really cared about. And that's really where my tech marketing career started now I still play Amazing. music I, I I love music but I'd, I'd done everything I could with music and it had become really exhausting for me to pull my heart out all the time there's only one thing I'd still like to do and that's have a, a song on a movie but I'll get there one day but it, it sort of pushed me into like I I can put both things together and and have it um in a way that I you know feel an expert in this area of community management and that's where it began. So I did a couple of years at Google and then I joined Hootsuite because I'm one of those people that have a list of companies that I'm, I'd am i like to work at. And I always used to be so impressed with Hootsuite's employee branding mm -hmm. and how they presented themselves online as an organization. And I wrote, I wrote to them when I was um, looking at them and I said, look, I've got this, this, these skills I'm desperate to come and work for your company. Is there any way we can have a conversation about life at Hootsuite? And one of the recruiters said, yeah, we can have a chat. And we did, um, but there was no roles. And it took about seven or eight months for a role to actually appear that I was suitable for. But because I'd already made a contact there, I was top of mind for mm -hmm. them. So I, I was invited to apply and 
I, I think that's that's an important thing to do is like try and think about your career one step ahead. So I'm constantly amazed how many people don't do that. Uh, I got my first mar proper marketing job having written to, I did a sport marketing degree and then wrote to every sports club in the area, a uh, professional sports club in the area. Yeah. I got two responses. Uh, I sent loads of letters out. I got two responses, one saying, uh, thank you, but with no jobs. Another saying, thank you, we'll keep your CV on file. I got a phone call six months later saying, can you come in for an interview? I was remember going, who are you again? Yeah. It, oh, right. Yes, I remember. <laughs> you know. it, I, I think it's it can feel like a lot of effort. And trust me, I, there's been hundreds of times where I've been ignored or rejected. And I, I get it. That's part of job hunting. But I think, especially in this day and age where it's, it's all about connection. It's all about building your network. Even if you get a, I'm really sorry, there's nothing available at the moment, but sign up here and keep an eye on the jobs, get in contact if you see something. That's that's better than nothing. Um, and yeah, it, I mean, they say job hunting is a full-time job and having worked with some of um, some younger uh, recent graduates, I, I mentor a lot of, of, of graduates, um, seeing how they've struggled to find to find roles in the in the last year has been really um it's been really sad but they have found them now yeah. so i'm like it's heartbreaking isn't it i mean I'm, it like, is, yeah. I'm so glad i'm not graduating now or graduating during the financial crash of 2009 or whatever it just must be heartbreaking trying to get yeah. into the job market at the minute it's yeah well that that's why i, I mean so quick sidestep i'm also studying organizational psychology at the moment just because Ooh. you know it's a i'm super interested in how work works um so i'm doing a master's in that at birkbeck and um it is mind-boggling that the, the, there's so much and mentorship is a big part of what we're looking at and mm -hmm. i've always taken mentorship incredibly seriously not necessarily having my own mentors i've got a few that i've they don't know they're my mentors I've, it's never been formalized but i've always wanted to be a mentor to younger versions of especially young women um mm -hmm. coming into the workplace from diverse backgrounds wh wh whatever it might be i just want to be able to give them a help give them either a step into the working world or support them as they navigate it because i didn't really have anybody doing that for me when i think about my early career which was in magazines and i i worked at a, a magazine that i really didn't do too well at. i was arguably in in a bit of a I didn't have a very nice boss and I was too young and naive to say this isn't acceptable and yeah and I I, I hate the thought of those kind of things happening to to young professionals so I'm always trying to help them get into where they want to get whether that's through job applications or whatever it might be or just to be a sounding board for is this is this contract fair is this a is this how I should be being treated you'd be surprised how many people feel lucky that they've been given a chance and yeah. it is and a two-way thing especially at the minute as well you know you hear people say oh you know well we're looking to have a job at the minute so yeah but the law is there so you don't have to go around saying i'm lucky i'm having a yeah. job even though my yeah. holiday pay is being docked and my like no that, that, that yeah. doesn't happen yeah, so, you know, like, yeah, yeah. and actually that, that's one of my my biggest sort of pieces of advice to anybody interviewing especially for first jobs uh, or second jobs is you've got to you've got to remember that you and theory are interviewing that employer as much as they're interviewing you. It, it, it's, they, they need you, they need someone like you or you wouldn't be sitting in that seat. So if there's anything in that interview that triggers a gut feeling that, Oh, I don't know if I, I don't know if I'd fit here. I don't know if I like this. Like, don't be afraid to go. This doesn't feel right in the name of I I'm lucky to, to have a job. Like I, I understand that you, sometimes you don't have a choice, but yeah it's my biggest thing when I think of some of the early jobs that I've done or some of the interviews I've been in and I've progressed through the process and I knew in I knew in the first interview that it wasn't going to be a right fit yet I still put myself through the pain of rejection anyway <laughs> like... I mean you think of how much of your life you spend at work it, I mean it, it is easy I, I've learned this the hard way as well like, that, it, I, I just will not take being unhappy at work anymore I've started my own company to, to get some of that happiness and even now I've been in the company, it's coming up to four years, and is that I only work, if I start to get that vibe off a client when I'm meeting them, I'm like, no, that work with you. 
<laughs> it's just yeah. I, I am yeah. not, you know th this is my life I am not losing my life for yeah. you if I don't think it's it, going to be worth it I think it take it takes a while to get there because especially early career oh, yeah. whether you work for people or you work for yourself like there is this period of time where you, you you're building a business or you're building your career so you you don't really say no absolutely but I think having the the, the goal in mind to be able to say this isn't right or you know that when I'm a manager, I'm not going to treat people like that. whatever it might be. As long as you've got that forward view of what yeah. what matters, I think that that's really important. Great. Well, now I know you you're, you're a singer. Um, I, I'm going to sing to you. Uh, I'm going to <laughs> sing the top tip theme tune in a moment. And, and what I want you to do is, um, people love LinkedIn. Um, and what I want to hear is a top tip or two from you um, about using LinkedIn generally, you, you know, so ju yeah. just whatever your okay. tips are. And you can also give me a score out of 10 for, for my singing. Um, okay. And if it's anything over four, I know you're lying, but that's okay. <laughs> so, uh, right, we're, we're, it's now time for uh, everyone's favorite part of the show, T-O-P-T-I-P -T -I -P from Lizzie about LinkedIn. <laughs> Lizzie. That was beautiful. That was magical. So um, many tips for LinkedIn. I think the biggest, um, from a job hunting perspective, I think remember that LinkedIn is a search engine and whatever you're putting on your profile is going to increase your chances of being found. So it's really important to tailor it, to update it, to keep it updated, to, to keep your skill section updated. And, you know, it's, it's, it's very easy to endorse people these days. So making sure that you're asking for the right kind of endorsements. Um, I try to give my LinkedIn profile a, a a quarterly review not that i'm looking for a job but you know it's important to it's important to to keep it up to date so i'd say that's from a kind of personal brand job hunting perspective from a marketing um point of view given that i'm marketing to marketers in my job i think it is all about the content that you share linkedin has impeccable targeting options it has multiple formats and ways that you can reach your audience so it's really taking the time to go back to basics on your content strategy to think about exactly what it is you're trying to get your customer or client to do so that you're standing out from the crowd because we have a lot of people using LinkedIn at any given time. So standing out is really important. So just take that time to really understand your audience. And you can do that uh, by partnering incredibly closely with your sales team. Sales and marketing alignment is a big a, a topic close to my heart, uh, as you know, Andy, because yep. that's what I, I spoke about when we so, uh, were at Inbound. Yep. Um, and yeah, I would so, say that which, is long-winded tips. Which is a beautiful, I, I'm going to do the theme tune one more time. You, you don't have to join me, but please do if you want to. Uh, <laughs> no. You go uh, ahead. <laughs> well, thank you for your T-O-P-T-I-P. Um, but you've also helped me segue brilliantly back into marketing sales alignment. Um, yeah, look, this has been, it's almost a battle as old as marketing as marketing itself, isn't it? Uh, sales team sitting at one side of the desk saying marketing's not doing their job, marketing saying sales not doing their job. Why is it, why does it suck so much um, generally? And what are the, what are the, the things you, you can do to make it better? Yeah. When, you know, and where does it work well? I think, why does it suck so much? Um, I think it's because it, it really does take work and commitment. So uh, there, I'm in a huge organization. There are hundreds of sales folks and teams, you know, even I who preaches about the importance of sales and marketing alignment. There's a lot of people who probably wouldn't even know who I am. And be like, well, she's, she's obviously not practicing what she preaches there. So the, it's a challenge, I think, in a large organization. I think if you're in a small organization, you, you have the luxury from the get-go to just go, let's have a conversation and we sit next to each other and we can have a coffee or a beer and we can literally make a plan together. We So actually this time last year, I finished a piece of research that we'd um, commissioned Forrester to help us with. Mm -hmm. And it was to really try and understand your question, like why is it it's so hard? And we surveyed across Europe uh, numbers will I have to clarify, but around 350 senior, senior, well, mid to senior sales and marketers. The reason we went mid to senior is because I think if you were to speak to the ultimate senior crew, they would be like, yeah, we're aligned because we're literally planning together. But it's when you start to filter it down into people like me who have to get get it done, it can, that's where it can all go a little bit, um, a little bit by the wayside. So what 
came out of this research was a, a very interesting kind of Instagram versus reality story. So you had the like 97% of the, the, the community that we surveyed said, yes, sales and marketing alignment is incredibly important for us in the next 12 months. And this was like, as COVID was really coming into a thing, it's incredibly important. We all believe it's going to increase our revenue. We all believe it's going to result in a, a positive customer experience. This is absolutely something we should do. Additionally, there was the, the flip side, which was 97% of people said, it, it, this isn't working for us here. We are struggling in um, four core areas, which is um, which was process, strategy, content, content and messaging, my favorite one, and culture. So there's this huge sort of like belief that yes, we we believe in alignment and we are aligned, but then when you actually dialed into the nuts and bolts of what a business strategy is, it was almost the same results in reverse. So I was just like blown away by that because I just kept thinking this Instagram versus reality. It's like we're, we're telling everybody we're alive, but we're really not. T touching on to your, your, uh, your master's in um, organizational psychology, my, where I've seen worked with organizations trying to get marketing and sales alignment, the common fault I see where it's done badly is that it's not the planning for, you know, there's this great planning phase and marketing gets involved, sales gets involved, the right people are in the room. Yeah. Everything. yeah. And then you're like, well, why isn't this working? But when you talk to the individuals about what their targets and objectives are, that's where yeah. the alignment goes to shit. Yeah. Yeah. Is that, well, yeah, but we talk about this, but now I'm measured on this. And if you ask, if you show someone how you're going to measure them, they show you how they're going to perform. Yeah. So they, yeah. they perform the way they're measured. And, and yeah. that seems and, to be where it where it falls to, apart for me. Is that something you've seen? Yeah, and and that that's what came up in the research is one of the like fundamental reasons, particularly when it came to strategy and content and messaging. You know, there were um, again, this is a link that I can share with you, but there was this sort of overwhelming response that sales didn't get what marketing was saying in their content. Sales were measured on quarterly. Um, quarterly targets marketing were had a longer um you know were working to a longer buyer journey that, that yeah. there's so many like conflicts in that and you know again in the name of practicing what we preach when when this what was brilliant about this research is we kind of qualified a framework for how you would move forward and that is looking at the nuts and bolts of the process pillar the strategy pillar content and messaging mm -hmm. and culture and of course in my role content and messaging is like the, the easy the easy easy place to start. So my team now, particularly when it comes to things like ABM, when it comes to uh, C-suite engagement or high value campaigns, I would be in shock if I saw a, a, a plan that didn't involve close alignment through the funnel, if you will, with sales. Mm -hmm. like, I, a, I wouldn't sign it off, but also it, it, it does a, it's a muscle memory that's now been built with, with my team that we're typically working in partnership with the field marketing cr uh, crew team and the sales team. Um, and believe it or not, that's not something that we were necessarily doing before. And, and I think it, it does speak to this evolving nature of content marketing. Now, I, I know I've got my LinkedIn blinkers on, so it may not be like this for everybody, every content marketer out there, but it seems to me that the role of content marketing is really stretching in different directions and the sales relationship and sales and enablement piece is becoming a bigger part of that. Whereas previously it would be, here's a, here's an ebook you can send to your clients in an email drip. We've done yeah. our job. So yeah. 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 <laughs> and is, is ABM the answer account based marketing? Is that the answer to marketing and sales alignment? I think it's it's one of them. It's one of the easy places to start. Again, I keep using easy as if it just magically happens overnight. But <laughs> hey, listen, it's, it's great for consultants. Is ABM, you know? So, <laughs> yeah, if you just throw enough throw enough marketing acronyms at people, it's like, oh, they really know what they're talking about. <laughs> um, so you, yeah, you I, I'm busted. You've done me now. <laughs> I think that um, I think ABM is a really good place to start because it forces you both to put your audience hat on and again I know that sounds crazy but I I have surprised myself historically where I've realized that I haven't thought 
about the person or the the, the, the person on the other side. You know, it's all about it's all about me. <laughs> how am I going to prove my worth? How am I going to show how good my team is? You know, it's like, oh, hang on, you're, you're actually not important in this. It's the person who's spending the money on the other side or you're hoping is going to spend the money. So I think it, it does force this collective understanding of who it is you're trying to specifically target. And it does allow you to be a lot more um, specific in your approach for high value, um, mm. for high value um yeah. marketing in in my opinion i think at the scaled level it, again it, it still kind of forces this 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 conversation but it can be managed separately if that makes sense as long as sales know what marketing are doing in a scaled way then that that's kind of kind of cool but i think when you're targeting high value accounts and you really want to go the extra mile the integration part is so important and a lot of it should feel like it's a shared campaign and yeah. maybe the, the the lines of sales and marketing are a little bit more blurry in that. Yeah. Um, I, I, I describe ABM as is overlapping the, the the lines of sales and marketing. So that that because I, I think people talk to me about handoffs between sales and marketing. Yeah, and yeah. It, it just it sounds still sounds too separate to me. Like you have to be overlapped so that it, there isn't a handoff it just naturally you know sales know they're involved in this bit and they're just and all of a sudden you don't really notice but marketing aren't involved anymore yeah, you know, yeah. when did that happen and I think that's yeah, a bit more organic yeah. than a handoff process so, yeah. oh yeah absolutely um yeah I mean I've I've been in, in roles where you've literally handed a spreadsheet to the sales team of, of leads after an event and you're like Crack on. <laughs> can you follow up on these leads and I do think as marketers, you, you're meant to be looking at those things. So you, you are meant to kind of follow up. But I think it, it's fully dependent on the size of the organization as well. I mean, if you're a, a sales and marketing team of 10, it's very different to if you're a sales and marketing team of 500, you know. Definitely. Definitely. Listen, Lizzie, I have just seen the time. Um, we're sat here have, having an amazing chat and uh, we we're going to be here for another hour or two. So uh, just before I let you go, um, yes. you've probably got another meeting to run to, but let me ask you the two questions nobody's allowed to leave until they've answered. Okay. Number one, what books do you read? What would you recommend to people or podcasts or, or whatever? What, what's your answer to that one? At the moment, I'm doing a lot of academic reading for yep. my master's, um, which is which is um, brilliant, but intense. And also I'm not a natural academic reader. So I try and find things that are a little bit more accessible for me. Mm -hmm. So I have the book that I'm reading at the moment is called The Managed Heart and it's Commercialization of Human Feeling. It's by Arlie Russell Hotchchild. And it's I think it's a amazing to just understand the how human emotion has become like a commodity mm -hmm. and there's some really great examples in here of how back in the day flight attendants big, biggest asset was her smile and, and and literally the the psychologically psychological view that if your flight attendants are all smiling your plane is never going to crash you're going to be fine so it's, and, and that was what they were trained on so it's really really crazy but I think in as a marketer it's been really interesting to just further drill into why human feeling is so important when it comes to marketing especially in b2b so Brilliant. this is this is the one that i am um reading and i just on that yeah. i heard a story of um i think it's the shangri-la hotel where the word you, you're not your training tells you to never say no problem someone says oh can i have a drink yeah no problem just standard response because it has no and problem in it two negative words so don't say that's it of course Yes, it, yeah. Positively rather than negatively. Like, oh. it's, yeah, it's a bit like the, I've seen a lot of, um, I don't know if you'll call them memes or comments or, or whatever it is that comes back saying, if you're late to a meeting, don't apologize for being late. Say, thank you for your patience. It sets a more leadership type tone, yeah. but I'm like, I don't know if that works. So anyway, so. No. Um, <laughs> and my, my final question, what, what do you usually get asked on a podcast um, that I haven't asked you? Um, oh my goodness. Um, I. What's my favorite beverage? I mean, as a as a scene setter. <laughs> <laughs> Go on. What, maybe, what is your favorite? Well, the reason I thought you were going to ask me is because I I have my very fancy teapot and it's tea cozy here because you know it's a little little jumper on a cup of uh, on that a. That is um, a gangster tea teapot. cozy. That I know. Uh, Etsy homemade. I um, it's tea. English breakfast specifically, but I'm I'm getting more into herbal tea at the moment to try and lessen the amount of caffeine that I drink. 
I don't know why I thought that was a question you were going to ask me today. <laughs> Listen, some of the answers we've had, so, some people take it really seriously. Some think, uh, one of them was about golf handicaps and stuff like that. So uh, anything is possible at those questions. So don't worry about that. Okay. <laughs> Listen, Lizzie, thank you very much for your time. That's been amazing. We'll get links to everything we've talked about. And if you want to reach out and contact Lizzie, that, that will be in the show notes too. So just uh, click on the links and it'll take you straight to it. Thank you for listening. And I'll see you back here in a fortnight. Thanks.